he built the uh, Belgian astronomy in the 19th century. But he was also interested in social behavior. And the many studies he did on social behavior, one of them was on crime. And um, he was the first to note that the peak in terms of criminal behavior was around 26, 27 years of, of age. And after that peak, the violent behavior, uh, criminal behavior decreased with the age. Uh, next slide. I am on slide six. If I hope yes, it's, I think, it's yeah. working. Yes. Okay. So um, in 1993, the US National Academy of Sciences published a report on control and violent behavior. And their conclusion was the following modern psychological perspectives emphasize that aggressive and violent behaviors are learned responses to frustration, that they can also be learned as instruments for achieving goals, and that the learning occurs by observing models of such behavior. Such models may be observed in the family, among peers, elsewhere in the neighborhood and through the mass media. So this um, conclusion is that we learn to aggress and we learn from our family, our neighborhood and in the mass media. Um, next slide. The World Report on Violence and Health from uh, the World Health Organization in 2001 was essentially concluding, uh, having the same conclusion as um, the early report from the American organization. And um, in a nutshell, they were concluding the majority of young people who become violent and adolescent are adolescent limited offenders who in fact show little or no evidence of high levels of aggression or other problem behaviors during their childhood. So violence starts um, during adolescence. Next slide. All these conclusions were to a certain extent following the idea that Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the French philosopher, wrote in his book on education, the book called Emile in 1762. And um, the first phrase of uh, that book says, God makes everything good, man meddles with them, and they become evil. So we are born good, and the, uh, society makes us behave in an evil way. Next slide. <clears throat> in the early 1980s, I started a longitudinal study to try to understand how this learning happened. And so we followed 1,000 boys from their kindergarten year. At the end of the kindergarten year, they were six years old. And we followed them. Uh, we're still following them now and they are in their 40s. But the data that I'm showing you is a, a follow-up that we did from 
six years of age to 15 years of age. And we were very surprised by our results. We assessed their level of physical aggression every year from six to 15 years of age. And we observed that no one was increasing their frequency of physical aggression from six to 15 years of age. There was a group of boys who were highly physically aggressive in kindergarten and remained highly physically aggressive until adolescence. Some were relatively highly physically aggressive in kindergarten, but with time were less and less physically aggressive. And um, there was two other groups who were using physical aggression a little bit in kindergarten, but over time, uh, the frequency decreased. These results were extremely surprising to me and to uh, everybody who was studying physical aggression. And the reason it surprised us was because no one had done that before, followed the development of physical aggression from kindergarten to adolescence. And it was an important surprise to see that physical aggression was not increasing with age. And so the question became, when do they learn to aggress if they are the most frequently fighting, aggressing in kindergarten? Before answering that question, ne next, next slide. Uh, before answering that question, um, we looked at what, how these children who were highly physically aggressive from kindergarten uh, until adolescence, what they became over time. And we saw that the highly aggressive boys in kindergarten failed in school, were um, using and abusing tobacco, alcohol, drugs. They, had, they started to have sexual relationships very early. They were violent as adults, depressed, unemployed, and living in poverty. Um, so aggressive kindergarten children, highly aggressive kindergarten children are likely to have to become adults who have a lot of problems. And I want you to think at the moment, what kind of fathers do you think they become. Next slide. We also studied girls from kindergarten until adulthood. And we found that there were girls who were highly aggressive and hyperactive from in kindergarten. And over time, the frequency of their aggression and uh, of um, hyperactivity decreased, but those who were the most aggressive and hyperactive in kindergarten, when they became adults, they also had problems with tobacco abuse, with school failure. They started to have sexual relationships early. Their partner was aggressing them they were depressive. They started to have children doing, during adolescence. And when they became adults, they um, had to um, uh, ask for welfare from the state. Next slide. 
Um, so the question that I had, uh, having followed these kindergarten children, was when does physical aggression start if it um, is at its peak during kindergarten? And so we started a new longitudinal study um, from birth. Next slide. Um, this longitudinal study followed more than 2,000 children, and we assess the children every year. Uh, they are now close to 30 years old, and we are still following them. Next slide. What do we see when we start at birth and we look at the development of children? Well, this is a slide, um, a picture that was sent to me by a good friend of mine um, with whom I worked uh, when we were working with juvenile delinquents. And um, his son had a son, uh, so my my friend is a, the grandfather of the boy on the right of the picture there. And he sent me that picture saying, look at what my grandson is doing. He's doing the things that you're interested in. Um, so I asked the mother uh, if I could show uh, the picture when I do presentations. Um, and she said, yes, but at one condition. When you show that picture, you must say that he was only defending himself. Um, so we start early, very early to aggress, uh, but our mothers uh, tell us that um, it's only because we were defending ourselves. Now I'm going to show you a video of aggression among children uh, so that you understand what we're talking about when we are talking about aggression among very young children. Richard, in this point, uh, I ask you to share your screen because it is not possible to play this film from my, my, my computer. May, uh, is it possible for you to do it, please? And I'm going to, je vais arrêter de partager l'écran et tu peux partager juste pour le film ton écran. Est-ce que tu serais d'accord? Uh, C'est possible de faire ça, oui? Oui, en bas, tu, uh, je vais arrêter de partager l'écran, d'abord, parce que je ne peux pas le, le passer. J'arrête, ça y est, et là, oui. en bas, il y a un petit, euh, un petit, euh, petite fenêtre qui dit partager l'écran. C'est toi qui vas partager l'écran et tu mets le film, s'il te plaît. Oui, mais je, je suis pas sur, euh, je suis sur le PowerPoint là. Comment, comment est-ce que je peux Alors, faire ça? Tu, tu dois aller sur l'écran, sur le numéro 15. C'est le numéro 15, le, le, le film. Oui, non, j'ai le numéro 15, mais je ne vois pas le partager l'écran. Ah, juste à côté, dès là où tu as trouvé le monde, il y a euh, participants, conversation et partager l'écran. Il y a comme une petite flèche verte, juste en bas. Euh, Francisco, je, je pense qu'on va abandonner cette idée de, de monter cette vidéo parce que je ne vois pas là comment... D'accord. Alors, on va continuer. Peut-être tu pourrais ouais. expliquer qu'est-ce que tu voulais montrer. Ouais. Alors, je vais partager euh, l'écran à nouveau. OK. Uh, so, what we can't show you is... Uh, uh, you may have heard uh, the, the children uh, yelling and crying, but it's uh, two boys that are fighting and hitting each other uh, with toys. Uh, and we can see that it's, if they were adolescents, uh, they would have uh, uh, hurt themselves uh, a lot. Um, okay, so 
I'm going to 16, slide 16. Yes, it is. Okay, so um, this slide is showing um, the development of physical aggression from uh, two years, uh, that is from birth, in fact, uh, to um, uh, 13 years of age. Uh, the, the upper part of the slide is showing girls and the lower part is showing boys. And you can see that it's very similar for girls and boys. Uh, the time, it's clear in, in terms of uh, all the data that has been accumulated that the time in life when humans are most frequently physically aggressive is between two and four years of age. In English, the expression is the terrible twos. Um, and you can see that that is true for girls and boys. The girls are on, on the upper part of the slide and the boys on the lower part of the slide. And uh, those who are most aggressive in the green uh, line for the girls, you can see that girls learn much more quickly than boys not to aggress, but the girls in green remain aggressive even during uh, adolescence, although it's much less than the boys. Um, and this is very important to remember uh, that there is a group of girls uh, who were highly aggressive uh, in early childhood, have decreased their frequency of physical aggression, but remain among the most uh, aggressive uh, for girls. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> So one of the conclusions that we uh, can make from uh, these studies on the development of physical aggression from very early childhood onwards is that we, we think we see adults as being more aggressive than children, mainly because adults are taller and stronger. If you were putting to bed a three-year-old um, and he would wake up the next morning um, and was a, as tall as his father and had still the brain of a three-year-old, that child you would not want to live with him. The frequency of physical aggressions during childhood is very, very high. And if the children were six feet tall and as strong as adults, we would not want to live with our children. So, um, and St. Augustine had discovered this and mentions this in one of his writings. Um, that um, we can see from the violence of children, uh, the idea of the original sin. And the reason we tolerate children is because of the weakness of their limbs. Next slide. So the conclusions from the longitudinal studies that we have done on early childhood development is that humans do not learn to physically aggress. Humans learn not to physically aggress. Chronic physical aggression is very rarely something that starts late. This appears to be true for other behavior problems such as stealing and destruction of property. Children steal and destroy property regularly in daycare centers. Boys are more likely than girls to be frequently using physical aggression. 
and physical aggress aggressive boys and girls are at high risk of numerous long-term biopsychosocial problems. Next slide. Now I want to talk about the intergenerational perspective, intergeneration, intergenerational in the sense of from parents to children and the children to their own children. The best early environmental predictors of chronic physical aggression are the following, and I'm using Hydra as an example of the importance of that problem. The maternal anger, maternal depression, maternal stress, maternal antisocial behavior, maternal smoking, poverty, maternal low education, teenage pregnancy, and poor marital relationships are the best predictors of children who will become very aggressive and will remain aggressive uh, during adulthood. So we show with our longitudinal studies that there is this intergenerational transmission of behavior problems. The children who do not learn to control themselves early on will continue to lack control of their behavior. Next slide. So th this is a way, this slide is a way of representing the intergenerational continuum of adverse environments and chronic physical aggression. Uh, we have shown by uh, doing genetic analyses and epigenetic analyses um, that there is a biological uh, path uh, for these problems. The, the girls who have behavior problems tend to choose mates, to choose men to have children who are very similar to them. So you have an aggressive, uneducated girl living with an aggressive, uneducated boy. And of course, there will be part of the transmission to the child is genetic. And the other part is in environmental. Um, and, and part of the environmental effects of um, the, these behaviors is that they have epigenetics effects on the development of the children. Uh, and during the discussion, we can, I can explain what I mean by uh, epigenetic effects. One example is smoking. Smoking has a negative impact on the development of the brain of the baby in utero. And that affects the development of the brain in the long term. So a social behavior like smoking uh, has a biological impact on the development of children's uh, brain. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> a very good example of where we should start um, is that the prenatal and infancy nurse home visitation that has been done in the United States and is now being done in many countries. And in fact, uh, I've seen that a similar program is um, 
has started, is being experimented in Brazil. Um, the uh, prenatal and infancy nurse home visitation programs can help uh, the mothers and the fathers that I have been talking about uh, to help their children learn not uh, to use physical aggression. And one of the results uh, of uh, the experiment that was done in the United States is showing that the girls are learning much better than the boys to control themselves when we provide uh, such a program. Um, the idea that <clears throat> we should start very early to prevent uh, the violence and delinquency uh, was in the, written in a book by Lucien Beauvais, a, um, a child psychiatrist in Switzerland, who was asked by the World Health Organization um, to study what were the best preventive interventions to prevent juvenile delinquency. And in 1951, he wrote um, as a conclusion that probably we should help girls who have delinquency problems much more than boys because by helping the girls, we will help the next generation of children and prevent uh, violent, delinquent and violent behavior. Next slide. The intergenerational approach to prevention uh, that I am advocating based on our results is also advocated in the health towards health problems. And David Barker wrote the following, uh, follow, uh, in terms of his studies on obesity. Chronic diseases are not inevitable, an inevitable lot of humankind. We could readily prevent them had we the will to do so. Many babies in the womb in the Western world today are receiving unbalanced and inadequate diets. Protecting the nutrition and health of girls and young women should be the cornerstone of public health. Protecting the nutrition and health of girls and young women should be the cornerstone of public health. We can say the same for violent behavior. Not only will this prevent chronic disease, but it will produce new generations who have better health and well being through their lives. So the idea is that for physical health, as well as mental health, we need to start at least during pregnancy. Next slide. The intergenerational continuum of adverse environment and chronic physical aggression is mediated by DNA methylation. DNA methylation is a way of changing our genes from the environment. And these changes have serious impacts on the development of our brain and the development of our body. It's involved in obesity as well as in criminal behavior. The person who said everything that I'm saying this morning uh, in a very simple phrase 
is the chief of the Soli people in Zambia. She said, when you educate a man, an individual is educated. When you educate a woman, you educate her children and thus the nation. Um, next slide is my last slide. Thank you. On va attendre, Richard, une, une section des questions, mais on va attendre les instructions au Chili. Eh, hola, espero que me estén escuchando ahora. Eh, queremos agradecer a Richard Tremblay por su, por su presentación. Como les comentábamos al comienzo, en el chat va a ser el espacio a través del cual nosotros podemos eh, compartir eh, las preguntas que queramos, que queramos hacer para poder eh, desarrollar esta, esta conversación. Y eh, aprovechando la palabra, vamos a, vamos, nos vamos a tomar la patudez de hacer las primeras preguntas. Hay dos preguntas que, que a partir de la presentación surgen y que a mí eh, en particular me, me quedan dando vueltas. La primera tiene que ver con, eh, vista la presentación y, el, y la situación de la, de la agresión y la violencia que presenta el, el profesor Tramblay, ¿Cuál es la lectura que se puede hacer respecto de la situación de los niños y de la necesidad de actuar desde una perspectiva de derechos? ¿Cuál es la, cuál, ¿De qué manera dialoga esta aproximación al, al tema de la agresión y la violencia con un enfoque de derecho? Y la segunda pregunta eh, tiene que ver con el contexto actual en el que vivimos. Como señalamos en algún momento, intentamos señalar en algún momento, eh, nos encontramos en una situación actual que ha modificado de manera radical, las eh, dinámicas familiares que han transformado nuestra forma de vida en sociedad, en, en los contextos de cuarentena. Eh, UNICEF plantea que eh, estamos en un escenario en que se presentan una serie de riesgos aumentados para la emergencia de situaciones de violencia y desprotección eh, hacia niños, niñas y adolescentes. Y esa información, ese riesgo, eh, de alguna manera se ve constatado... Tenemos un micrófono que se prende y se apaga, ahí se apagó. Eh, se ve constatado con cifras que dan cuenta en la región, en América Latina al menos, de eh, el aumento de las denuncias y de situaciones de violencia intrafamiliar. Aumentos que van, eh, incluso en Chile se habla de un 70%, hay comunas que plantean aumento del 500% en denuncias de situaciones de violencia, llamados de auxilio que aumentan en México en un 70%, en Sao Paulo en alrededor de un 40%. Por lo tanto, nos encontramos en un escenario eh, de violencia acrecentada, de violencia familiar acrecentada y de muchas dificultades para el poder desarrollar programas eh, orientados a la prevención, a la protección y a la interrupción de las situaciones de violencia. Entonces, en ese marco, eh, ¿cuáles son las implicancias que tiene y cuáles son los desafíos eh, y algunas alternativas de acción para poder hacer frente al tema de la violencia a la que están expuestos niños, niñas y adolescentes? Yes. Um, so the, the first question concerning the rights, um, it's, it's not clear to me exactly what is, is meant by the rights, but it, it's very clear to me that uh, <clears throat> every child that is born uh, has the right that is born in our societies um, has the right to have the environment uh, that is needed to um, become an adult uh, that uh, has um, um, all that is needed to, to maximize his poten potentialities. Um, Uh, so uh, the problem of rights is is not having the right, but can we put can we give the resources uh, that will 
help uh, these children. Uh, I, I'm, my presentation is focused on uh, the idea that there are, we know that there are children who will not get the environment that will enable them to become what they could become if they had um, an adequate environment. And this is true for violent behavior as well uh, as uh, physical health problems, as well as education. Uh, and, and to solve these problems, uh, we need as a society to invest important resources in the next generation. Um, and, and investing in the next generation means often that we have to accept that the previous generation will have less than uh, the next generation. Uh, and this is extremely uh, difficult to do. Now, I, I will continue my answer to that first question in saying, if we then link this to the crisis, that worldwide crisis that we have at the moment, the danger is that we will put a lot of resources on the immediate problems and we will forget that we need to invest our resources for the long term. And I have no doubt um, that in the same way that a lot of older people are dying today because of, of the pandemic, uh, that a lot of young children are suffering uh, from uh, the fact that we can, could not prevent that pandemic. Uh, but I hope that we will put as more resources uh, in helping these families, these children, than we will put in trying to um, uh, give uh, all our resources to save the life uh, of, of older people. Um, I, I think from that, there is this uh, big danger that, that we, we look at uh, all the people who are dying and we forget those that are starting life in situations that are totally uh, awful. But th so there's no uh, short solution to the problem. It's, it's, a, it's investments that we must think in terms of generations, intergenerational uh, investments rather than short-term investments. Andrés, Sergio. Sí, sí. Vamos a, muchas gracias, eh, profesor. Vamos a continuar con las preguntas respetando el orden por un lado y por otro lado, como viendo de alguna forma la, la manera en que algunas de estas preguntas están eh, eh, asociadas. Eh, Hay un, un tema que, que aparece en algunas de las preguntas, tiene que ver con eh, su eh, planteamiento respecto de que eh, las mujeres aprenden mejor que los hombres a controlar la agresión. Eh, y frente a eso aparecen como dos temas. Lo primero es, eh, ¿qué es lo que puede estar, qué es lo que explica que eh, mujeres aprendan eh, mejor que los hombres a controlar la agresión? Eh, ¿Y cuáles son las implicancias que esto tiene eh, para, el, el, para los temas de crianza? Para los temas de crianza y principalmente eh, lo que tiene que ver con la, la corresponsabilidad 
y en la forma de involucramiento de las figuras masculinas en los temas de crianza. Well, um, for us men, it, the lesson is, is that um, we are probably the weaker sex. Um, the, it's, it's very clear um, from the study of, of the development of children that, that girls, not only in terms of uh, physical aggression, learn more quickly, but they are better in school um, now that we permit women to go to school, to go to university, it's becoming very clear that girls are much more um, intellectually uh, able, um, not only in controlling their physical aggression, but also for uh, succeeding in schools. Uh, and the only reason that uh, males have been dominating many of uh, uh, the uh, higher positions in societies is because there was a tradition of um, investing more in boys than in girls and not enabling girls to go to school and, and uh, continuing their, their, their schooling. Um, there's all sorts of, uh, of reasons why um, girls uh, are um, more able to control themselves. And these reasons are in a large part biological reasons. Um, I don't want to go into the details uh, uh, of these reasons, but we must accept that it's um, we should girl, boys should try to imitate girls rather than girls imitate boys in, in terms of um, living in society. Andrés o Sergio. Um, tipo otras otras preguntas que han surgido acá en, en el en el chat eh, tienen que ver con vuelven al contexto del confinamiento eh, y básicamente en el fondo van por por dos lados eh, por una parte eh, de qué manera podría eh, afectar eh, la situación de confinamiento y las prácticas que están eh, asociadas al confinamiento al interior de las familias, las dinámicas familiares, podrían estar afectando eh, el desarrollo de niñas y niños en el largo plazo. Eh, y por otro lado, volviendo un poco al, a lo que se comentó en un primer momento, en un escenario en que eh, los distintos programas o eh, iniciativas tendientes a la prevención, la, la alerta frente a situaciones de violencia eh, y la protección de niños y niñas se ve afectada o incluso interrumpida en el, en el contexto de, de, de cuarentena, ¿qué tipo de acciones se pueden desarrollar eh, en, esta en este contexto de crisis como para poder eh, abordar eh, adecuadamente estas situaciones y efectivamente proteger eh, el desarrollo y el bienestar de los niños? Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid that I don't have <laughs> the solutions for, for these problems. In, in, I, I, my perspective on this is that in normal times, we are not doing what we should be doing to help these families in normal times. My impression that is that in a time of crisis uh, like this one, we are unable to still more 
unable to answer the question that you are asking um, because we are in a situation where the resources, the limited resources that we have are allocated to solving, uh, to, to helping those who are dying and we are putting ourselves all in a situation where we are protecting ourselves um, because we fear to be sick and, and dying. So trying to solve the problem that we could not solve before the crisis appears to me impossible. Uh, but if we, um, if we have resources, we should give these resources to those who need it most rather than, and those who need it most are, are those who um, had uh, the problems before the pandemic. Uh, I'm I'm very sorry to have this, <laughs> not to be able to tell you um, here's the solution, but I cannot see, and I would like to hear you um, if someone that's listening has uh, solutions. I would very much like to hear it, but I'm not a specialist of intervening during a crisis. Um, my work has shown that we should intervene before there is a crisis. Uh, in a crisis, we can not prevent, uh, uh, have a long-term uh, perspective on prevention. And there is, <coughs> pardon. Sí, en, en honor al tiempo vamos a eh, dejar el, vamos a plantear unas tres preguntas más. Eh, te, la primera pregunta que quería eh, señalar eh, a partir de la información eh, y de las preguntas que nos llegan tiene que ver con eh, las intervenciones que... Eh, que en materia, por ejemplo, preventiva se pueden desarrollar eh, a distancia, eh, intervenciones online. Eh, eh, este ha sido un periodo en el que eh, mucha información, en el fondo, es entregada a través de redes sociales en relación a temas como eh, crianza, estimulación, eh, compatibilización de eh, las funciones de cuidado con el, con el tema del trabajo, eh, eh, guías para la estimulación y para el juego y el acompañamiento a niños y niñas. Eh, y me imagino que hay muchas más herramientas que se van desarrollando en materia incluso de, eh, de intervención, de intervención con niños e intervención con, con, con familias a distancia. La primera pregunta es si usted tiene eh, algún, alguna experiencia y conocimiento acerca del de desarrollo de estas herramientas eh, y si pueden eh, surgir como una alternativa, tanto en lo que tiene que ver con la prevención y el acompañamiento a las familias en el contexto de, de, eh, de cuarentena. Y la segunda pregunta que surge, que bueno, también es un comentario que eh, está apareciendo bastante en el chat, tiene que ver con eh, si el, el estudio, los estudios que se han desarrollado eh, se han considerado eh, eh, un análisis desde la perspectiva de, de, de género, eh, en el sentido de eh, cuál es la, el impacto que tienen los roles y estereotipos eh, de género y la división del trabajo de hombre y mujer en la sociedad, eh, y de qué manera eso puede también estar impactando en el fondo, las diferencias de comportamiento entre hombres y mujeres. Um, yes. Well, uh, in terms of, of using um, the, me the, the, 
the, the electronic means that we are using at the moment to talk to each other uh, for interventions, uh, it, it's very clear that we should be doing that. Um, we may be confined, but we still can speak to each other. Uh, and if we can speak uh, to each other from Canada to uh, to Chile, uh, we we can speak to each other within a city, <laughs> um, and and we can speak to those who uh, need it most. Uh, and so the the I think that one of the solutions at the moment to, to do as much as we can is to uh, use um, the, the, the web uh, to be able to support those families that need uh, most support. Unfortunately, usually they are the ones who don't have uh, the equipment necessary to, to do this. Um, but we are uh, developing at the moment a uh, program where we uh, will start an experimentation with pregnant women who are um, who have uh, mental health problems, um, and the experiment will be um, doing uh, the intervention uh, through uh, through the web. Um, and if if you have um, resources, uh, I I think that that is the 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 most important thing we can do at the moment is stay connected to do to those who need it most who need us most uh, and. Um, The limit is, I think, if if your society is like ours, those who need it most do not have the equipment needed to connect to them. Um, so, so that's the problem. And, and I, I'm, I, I think that the pandemic is teaching us uh, an important lesson is that we need to prepare ourselves um, for pandemics. And, and, and so we need uh, to help those who are in, uh, who, who need it most uh, before a pandemic arrives and then we're uh, we don't know what we can do to to save the world. Um, so I hope that the pandemic will teach us a lesson that we need to organize ourselves um, for helping those who need it most, uh, because there it not only um, to help them but to help our societies in in the long run. Andrés, por favor. Uh, can, can I, Muchas I, gracias. Uh, can eh, I, I, I just add, um, ¿sí? one, I, I want to add one, one more Parece thing. Que... Uh, I would like to say other thing, other words. Ju just one more thing. Yeah. Um, it, it's that um, we, we should use the situation at the moment as a lesson uh, that we need to do interventions that are planned long term. We need to stop to think short term. Even at the moment, we 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 tend to say, "Well, we need to act now, now, now to solve the problem." We should all be trying to plan what we will be doing after the pandemic to prevent the problems rather than spend too much time trying to solve short-term problems.
Andrés, por favor. Sí. Eh, hay, bueno, quería volver sobre una, una de las preguntas, y esto eh, para poder eh, cerrar, eh, y, y que tiene que ver con eh, la, la segunda pregunta, o de la primera pregunta que la realizamos, eh, respecto de cómo se incorpora la perspectiva de género en los estudios. Eh, y principalmente la forma en que eh, distintos estereotipos de, sobre lo masculino y lo femenino pueden estar entrando en juego eh, y pueden estar eh, eh, implicando formas de trato o de relaciones diferenciadas entre hombres y mujeres que pueden, en fondo, facilitar la emergencia o no de ciertas formas de comportamiento. Um. I, I I think that um, what from 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 the studies that we've done, we see clearly that there are very important differences between males and females and that these important differences are impacted by the environment in which in which we we live um, <clears throat> i am working on um, a book with colleagues trying to explain what happened in the past 50 years Uh, that can explain the fact that um, the majority of um, students at university in medicine um, and in many other fields are girls and that the girl, the boys have more problems um, finishing high school um, and entering universities. Uh, so there are clearly the women and men have not changed in the past 50 years much in terms of biology. What has changed is the environment that has enabled women to be, to become what they can become. Um, and it appears that this is posing an important problem for uh, part of the males. Uh, and my impression is that our societies are evolving um, in the right direction from, from that perspective. Andrés, por favor. Um, bueno, eh, profesor Tremblay, eh, estamos, ya en la, estamos ya en la hora de, de nuestra hora de término. Queríamos agradecerle eh, enormemente su disposición a poder compartir con usted, o sea, con nosotros, eh, el trabajo, el fruto de, del trabajo que ha venido realizando en materia de investigación y desarrollo de primera infancia. Creo que nos pone algunos temas que son desafiantes eh, y que me parece que son interesantes de poder, de poder tener a la vista. Principalmente el hecho de que estamos en un escenario que efectivamente está modificando dinámicas y prácticas en torno a la niñez, eh, que, nos está, que nos ha eh, alterado la vida y que nos genera un, es, un escenario de tremenda incertidumbre y una tremenda pregunta sobre qué es lo que tenemos que hacer y qué es lo que tenemos que hacer ahora. Y, y ocurre que en esa pregunta sobre qué es lo que tenemos que hacer ahora se nos olvida eh, justamente cuál es la mirada a largo plazo, cuáles son los aprendizajes respecto de las formas en que esta eh, crisis nos está afectando como sociedad actualmente y de cómo la forma en que nos está afectando habla del tipo de sociedad que hemos construido 
del tipo de democracia que hemos construido, eh, del tipo de condiciones que hemos desarrollado hasta el momento para el desarrollo eh, y para el bienestar de los niños y niñas, y que probablemente muchas de las cosas, de las dificultades que estamos teniendo ahora, tienen que ver con intervenciones que no se realizaron en el momento oportuno. Eh, por lo tanto, surge un, desafío, un doble desafío. El desafío, por una parte, de poder eh, abordar de la mejor manera la urgencia eh, y el impacto que tiene la situación de confinamiento en la vida de niños y niñas y de las familias, y de cómo poder desarrollar las mejores herramientas para poder acompañar y abordar las dificultades que se pueden estar planteando en estos momentos, pero sin perder de vista cuáles son los desafíos con los que nos encontramos a largo plazo, y de poder mantener esa claridad respecto de la intervención en un contexto de crisis, pero también eh, con una tremenda claridad acerca de cuáles son los desafíos que se vienen por delante, y de cómo esta situación de crisis reafirma eh, la importancia de poder actuar en torno a esos propósitos de, de más largo plazo. Eh, Quiero agradecerles a todos, a nombre de la red y a nombre de la Fundación Horizonte Ciudadano, la, el tiempo y la disposición, el enorme número de personas que se eh, inscribieron. Para nosotros eso es una tremenda alegría y eh, una tremenda satisfacción. Y los dejamos invitados para un próximo encuentro que vamos a realizar, eh, si, no la, si no la próxima semana, en muy, en muy poquitos días más, les vamos a estar informando oportunamente a través de las redes una conversación con Soledad Larraín para poder abordar específicamente el, lo que tiene que ver con intervención en infancia en contextos de crisis, creo que nos puede entregar algunos elementos más para poder eh, tener mayor claridad acerca de pues ciertas gracias. acciones que podamos desarrollar. Así que muchas gracias a todos y eh, a todas, muchas gracias nuevamente, eh, profesor Tremblay, y estamos en contacto. Adiós.